Could I have everyone's attention? Folks, we're about to start. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the State of the City 2019. Your presence here tonight shows that you care about your city and you want to hear about the vision, the progress, and the challenges that remain ahead. So without further ado, let's get right to the program. Please rise for the presentation of colors by the Brockton Fire and the Brockton Police Honor Guards. We will then say the Pledge of Allegiance followed by the singing of the National Anthem by Jade Etienne. Say with me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Folks, before we move along, I just want to say a few words about our singer, because uh, she, she has to go home. Uh, Jade Etienne is a senior at Brockton High School, where she is active, an active member of the choral program. She is the alto section leader of the concert choir and also sings in the harmonics and chamber singers. She has sung with the Southeastern Mass Senior District Chorus, the Massachusetts All-State Chorus, and the American Choral Directors Association, Eastern Division, and National Honor Choirs. Next year, Jay plans to attend college for vocal performance, and we thank her for her patriotic spirit and sharing her talent with us tonight. Thank you, Jay. We're grateful to have people in our city like Jade who are talented, work hard, and are ready to take advantage of and help create new opportunities here in the city. And I see many of you here in the audience who share that view and many at home as well. Being grateful for what we have is only one of the things that our next speaker 
often talks about in church and also in his everyday life conversation. Father Michael of the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church is here to give us the invocation. And Father Michael, would you come on up? Lord, in the beginning you created heaven and earth, and you separated the waters from the land, and you said it was good. You then let the earth bring forth herbs of grass bearing seeds according to its kind and likeness, and fruit trees bearing fruit. And then you established the animals of all kind and finally created man and woman, the crown of your creation, and you said it was good. Upon this earth, Lord, countries and nations were established where humanity lives and governs. In the United States, you blessed our country with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the great city of Brockton. We pray that you continually say that we are good. We call upon you, our God, to continually bless our beautifully diverse and culturally fit city with peace, love, prosperity, and tranquility. In diversity, O oh Lord, we see your love. Bless our Mayor Bill Carpenter and all that govern our city with the wisdom of Solomon, the courage of David, the discernment of the prophets, and of all the great teachers of the universe, so that they will continually govern fairly and justly for the betterment of our citizens and for those that work, that serve, and for our friends that visit our city for entertainment or who visit for the cultural beauty that our fair city provides. Lord, make our stewardship for our city an unconditional commitment of love, and may our commitment be favorable to you, the great architect and creator of all. Amen. Thank you, Father. Our next guest will introduce the main speaker tonight. It was about two years ago, almost to the day, on this very stage that we thought we'd bring him up to introduce the mayor of Brockton, Bill Carpenter. But on that day, we didn't get his wit or his charm or his intelligence to come up here because they were having late votes in Washington on health care. He was stuck in D.C. Uh, we're thankful that's not the case tonight, but as he can tell you, that issue's on the horizon again, once again, almost the same way. He was recently named the chairman of the National Security Subcommittee, which has oversight over the Departments of Defense, State, Homeland Security, Veterans Affairs, and Justice, just to name a few. Please join me in welcoming the former iron worker, the former state lawmaker, and your congressman for the last 18 years, United States Representative Stephen Lynch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you, Darren, for that very generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Father Mike, for your, your blessing. I also know that uh, Bishop Orlando Harris is, is here as well. Uh, thank you, Reverend Clergy. Good to be with you. I uh, also want to recognize my colleagues in government, Senator Brady, Representative Claire Cronin, Representative Michelle Dubois, and Representative Jerry Cassidy, and the city council members and school committee and other officials from the uh, city. In addition, we have with us tonight uh, a gentleman who I first met in uh, Iraq, believe it or not, in Fallujah, uh, our veterans uh, secretary for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a recipient of the Purple Heart on our behalf, Francisco Urena. <laughs> uh, 
And so it, it is an honor for me to be here. I want to thank all of you for being here as well on this very important night. Uh, it is sincerely uh, a privilege for me to be on this stage and to be asked to introduce my friend uh, Bill Carpenter for his State of the City Address. Uh, when I was first elected to Congress, the congressional map was actually drawn differently. So when I, uh, when I first came to Congress, my mentor, uh, Congressman Joe Moakley, actually represented half of the city of Brockton, and, and the great Bill Delahunt represented the other half of the city of Brockton. And uh, it was a little awkward for me because every time I'd get a call at the office, I'd have to figure out what street people lived on. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, Bill Delahunt was kind enough that uh, he thought since I was brand new and he had been there for 20 years, that uh, whenever he got a, a, a call from a constituent, he would just refer to my office. <laughs> and uh, I guess he figured I needed the practice. So uh, after a while, I kind of figured out that uh, I was doing most of the work and Bill Delahunt was taking most of the credit. He was smart like that. He, he was trying to teach me a lesson, I think. But uh, shortly thereafter, at the urging of Mayor Jack Units at the time, and Senator Bob Creedon and Representative Jerry Creedon, and my friends uh, Red and Gene Sullivan, uh, they lobbied hard, and we lobbied hard, to have Brockton put into one congressional district. And uh, from that moment on, uh, with the help of Shana Barnes, a former city councilor here in Brockton, and uh, Araba A.J. Karanteng, who is my office manager in the Boston office now, uh, two young women from, from Brockton. From that moment on, it's been a distinct honor for me to represent all of the wonderful families of the remarkable city of Brockton in the United States Congress. And of course, because I spend four or five days a week in Washington, I've come to rely heavily upon my friend Bill Carpenter on each and every issue that we confront as a city. A big part of my job is to to make sure that the cities and towns within my district get the federal funding that they need for critical items such as infrastructure and affordable housing, programs to treat the opi opioid crisis, and transportation. I see Ray Ledoux out there who I worked with for many years on transportation issues. But in order for me to do my job and try to address these needs, again, uh, focusing on Brockton's needs, I rely heavily on Mayor Bill Carpenter. I trust his judgment. I trust that because of his work ethic, which is unmatched, and the relentless way that he advocates for Brockton, that he knows what is best for Brockton and its residents. I know that I can always depend on Mayor Bill Carpenter to tell me exactly, and he is not shy, to tell me exactly how the federal government can help improve the lives of Brockton's families. Mayor Carpenter is no stranger to D.C. He comes down whenever necessary to make sure that uh, all of Brockton's residents and their needs uh, are in, foremost in the minds of members of Congress, especially myself. He is very good at anticipating the next vulnerability that might appear. He's an excellent manager. And for any partnership to work, you need both partners trying to make it work. And the fact that Bill Carpenter's earnestness, his compassion, the power of his example as a leader that is reflected not only in himself but in his staff and the city workers across this city, that all has a, str that all has a strengthening effect on the working relationship between our offices, allowing us to better serve the families of Brockton. Mayor, Bill Carpenter's push for economic development and affordable housing is widely acknowledged in Washington and well established here at home. This is the third consecutive year that Brockton has led the metro Boston market in the number of single family homes purchased, which is a testament to Brockton's growing reputation for being a city where working professionals can live comfortably, safely, and actually afford a home. Bill Carpenter is a fierce advocate for first responders, 
our firefighters, our police, consistently working to secure federal funding to ensure that everyone has the equipment they need to keep Brockton safe, such as the federal grants that Bill was successful in working with the fire uh, department in obtaining that gave firefighters new breathing apparatus equipment. Mayor Bill Carpenter has worked to secure funding from matters that directly impact people's lives each and every day, such as the lead paint remediation program, which is extremely important when you, you have an older city with older housing stock. And while gun violence has touched every single city in America, Brockton was, the one, was one of only five communities nationally that was, reward, that was awarded a grant to jointly combat substance abuse disorders and gun violence. In fact, Mayor Carpenter has been nationally recognized for his work on the opioid epidemic after creating the Champion Plan, which allows anyone struggling from addiction to safely turn to local police and receive the shelter and treatment that they need. Throughout our time as public servants, I've come to accept that I can trust in Bill Carpenter's judgment, his experience, and his genuine concern for the safety, security, and prosperity of the residents of Brockton. And I know what, that he will relay to me exactly what Brockton needs to succeed. Sometimes politics can be difficult, especially lately. Some days you're pitching, some days you're catching. So after votes in Washington earlier this afternoon, I made sure that I was here tonight for my friend. We have to support and give thanks to people who serve the public, like Bill Carpenter. I am grateful for his guidance, for his assistance over these years, and for his relentless devotion to the families of Brockton. They say leaders are made and not born. I think that through his hard work and his advocacy and investment in the people of Brockton, Mayor Bill Carpenter has emerged as the champion for the city of champions. <laughs> Bill Carpenter is a wonderful reflection of the spirit and the love and the character of the city of Brockton. So please join me in a warm Brockton welcome for our mayor, Bill Carpenter. Thank you. I didn't realize this was going to be such a tough ticket tonight. Well, thank you so much, and good evening, uh, Congressman Lynch, Father Michael, city officials, members of the city council and school committee, our legislative delegation, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to report tonight that the state of the city is under construction. Tonight, as we look back over the progress of the past five years, I'm even more excited to look forward to the promise of the next five. We're making historic progress on the revitalization of our downtown and impactful economic development throughout the city. There's been an undeniable shift in how people perceive Brockton. We've spread a very positive and constructive message highlighting Brockton's unique attributes that is appealing to home buyers, businesses, and commercial investors. Brockton is establishing itself as a 21st century city. For the first time in a long time, we are leveraging Brockton's assets to attract new investment. We are effectively marketing our transit-oriented development strategy and Brockton's proximity to Boston to entice working professionals and families to locate here. As Thomas Edison once said, vision without execution is hallucination. 
Our vision of transit-oriented development is built with 40-hour smart growth zoning, utilizing a mixed-use model that revitalizes the business district on the ground level while developing market rate residences above it. As we continue to implement our downtown action strategy, we are already seeing the positive impact it is having on our great city. Evidence of Brockton's transformation into a viable, affordable alternative to Boston and its neighboring communities is already well on display. Over the last four years, Brockton has shown the highest period of new growth on record. And as the Congressman mentioned, for the third consecutive year, Brockton has led the metropolitan Boston market in the number of single family homes purchased. Today, investors see value in Brockton's underpriced commercial property. Companies like New England Tortilla and Fronto King have decided to move their manufacturing operations here to Brockton, bringing jobs and expanding our commercial tax base. Make no mistake, Brockton is open for business. The conversation about Brockton is changing. This year you'll see an unprecedented surge in the construction of market rate rental properties in Brockton's downtown. In fact, about 250 units of market rate housing are already scheduled for construction in 2019. Just a week ago, we witnessed the groundbreaking at 47 West Elm Street, where developer Joffrey Anatole is building a five-story ultra-modern apartment building with 44 units, all market rate. <laughs> For nearly 10 years, that was the site of a burned-out, deteriorating brick professional building before the city finally took it down. But it's noteworthy that this is a private development with local commercial financing provided by Mutual Bank, privately owned, privately financed, as is the renovation of 75 Commercial Street, the former DTA office, scheduled to open later this spring. True transit-oriented development, 25 market-rate apartments, locally financed by Eastern Bank, across the street from the commuter rail station in a previously vacant commercial building. Local banks are now making commercial loans on new development in downtown Brockton. We will also see a crane going up this summer at 121 Main Street, where construction is expected to begin by the end of June. 121 Main, known as the site of Kresge's department store for longtime Brocktonians, represents another classic mixed-use project. 48 residences built above 3,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space. And that commercial space is being designed to house a future restaurant. We realize that to attract and retain market rate residents downtown, we must create a livable, walkable downtown that features amenities, small businesses, and parking. Tonight, we introduced two new incentive programs to attract restaurants and small businesses to the downtown. First, attracting new restaurants downtown has been a challenge for decades. The lack of existing restaurant infrastructure coupled with the high cost of building out new restaurant space have hampered our efforts. Now, with market rate housing and a new parking structure under construction, the time is right to bring those new restaurants to the downtown area. In July, the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, in partnership with the city, will roll out a new $1 million restaurant loan fund. Landlords of downtown properties will be able to borrow funds to make permanent fixed improvements to their property in order to attract new full-service restaurants. Tonight, we also announced the creation of a rent rebate program to help establish small businesses in the downtown business district. The rent rebate program will provide rental assistance to small businesses locating into vacant storefronts 
and upper floor spaces during their first two years of operation. This program is modeled after similar programs that have had success in other cities like Brockton. The construction of the new downtown parking garage, already underway on Petronelli Way, will create parking for both downtown customers and employees while unlocking vacant parcels at the north end of the business district that are now ripe for new development. Tonight, we're able to announce two exciting new projects that are now ready to go forward directly as a result of the new downtown garage. Last Friday, the city passed papers on the sale of the historic Petronelli building to 28 Petronelli LLC, led by developer Ted Carmen. Ted's group will begin a complete rehab and historic restoration of the Petronelli building this spring creating 20 units of 100% market rate housing while preserving a landmark that we all hoped would be saved. <laughs> Just a block away, the Brockton Redevelopment Authority has signed a letter of intent with Boston-based developer Michael Ahern to, develop, to redevelop the longtime vacant 19 Main Street. Michael's team is now currently developing plans for about 17 residential units to be built out on the first floor with a restaurant to be built out on the first floor on the corner of Main and Green Streets. Now it's interesting, the BRA actually reviewed three bona fide proposals for 19 Main Street before selecting Michael O'Hearn's development group. Now can you imagine three different private developers competing for the same piece of commercial property in the heart of downtown? Four years ago, we couldn't give that building away. The game has changed in Brockton. The city now is in the closing process on the sale of the longtime vacant Corcoran building on Montello Street to an investor developer who will redevelop the property into a mixed use commercial residential complex that will feature a destination restaurant. In fact, the new owners have already entered into a development agreement with the G Hospitality Group to bring a full scale destination restaurant to downtown Brockton at the Corcoran Building. Now, the president of G Hospitality, Colin Joffrey, is here with us tonight. And Colin, show us where you are, because I'd like to ask everyone to join me in welcoming you to Brockton. Where's Colin? I know he's here. There he is, Colin. Thank you. Be sure to see a couple of the renderings out in the lobby on your way out, because Colin and his designers already have done substantial planning of the G-Pub that will occupy 8,000 square feet of the lower level of the Corcoran building and also offer a rooftop terrace during the warm weather months. The G-Pub will not only attract visitors to Brockton, but will also help us attract more restaurants to downtown. Whether we're attracting businesses and residents to the downtown, or home buyers to our neighborhoods, public safety and the perception of public safety are paramount to our success. When we first took office five years ago, fighting crime was our number one priority. It remains our number one priority today and it will continue to be for as long as I have the privilege to serve as your mayor. <laughs> We've adopted crime-fighting strategies that have worked, expanding our collaboration with county, state, and federal law enforcement agencies, sharing resources and intelligence while identifying targets of mutual interest. We've reduced violent crime by identifying repeat violent offenders because we know that a small group of individuals 
are responsible for most of the gun violence in the city. We've continued our commitment to community policing, including new outreach initiatives to overdose victims and survivors of domestic violence. We recognize that the common denominator among gun violence, property crimes, prostitution, and homelessness is drug addiction. And we've worked to reduce both the supply and the demand of illicit drugs by doubling the number of yearly drug raids while compassionately offering assistance to individuals struggling with a substance use disorder through our champion plan. Over the past five years, we've created motorcycle patrols, we reinstated bicycle patrols, and continued our commitment to increase police staffing each year by getting more boots on the ground. A living example of that is the five new school police officers who are just sworn in on Tuesday and are here with us tonight. If you could please just stand and be recognized by the crowd. Thank you. We are committed to continue to rebuild staffing on both our fire and police departments. We've just hired 11 new firefighters who begin their training on Monday, and they are also with us tonight. If you could show us where the firefighters are. Here they are, right here. You'll see them running through the streets of downtown soon enough. We're also pleased to have representatives from our EMS company, Brewster Ambulance, here with us this evening as well. Thank you for being here. Our crime-fighting efforts are creating results. Since January of 2014, robberies are down 22%, aggravated assaults have declined 29%, and firearm-related incidences have been reduced by 34%. The challenges we face are not simply police issues, though. They are community issues. We're taking a neighborhood-based approach to improve the quality of life for all of our residents. Every Thursday morning, I bring together a wide range of city departments and agencies including police and fire, to address issues that affect the everyday lives of Brockton residents and businesses. Our Quality of Life Task Force responds to specific problems that are occurring in our neighborhoods, such as properties that are not in compliance with health and safety codes, non-emergency issues reported to us through C-Click Fix, unlicensed or unpermitted businesses, junk cars, illegal dumping, just to name a few. And for the first time, all of these city departments are communicating with each other, providing a coordinated, multi-agency response to neighborhood issues. Now, now, utilizing crime data analysis, the Brockton Police Department will be allocating additional resources to specifically target neighborhoods through a new initiative being called, launched this spring called Link Up Brockton. Link Up Brockton is a crime and substance use disorder reduction initiative created with funds from a Department of Justice grant. One of only five communities in the nation to receive this grant, the city of Brockton was awarded nearly $700,000 to utilize crime mapping and reports analysis to identify and define the most pressing crime problems and hardest hit areas. In using that data, the Brockton Police Department will employ a true-pronged strategy to combat substance use disorder and firearms violence in those affected areas. Reclaiming our green spaces for use by families and children is a key to restoring safe, livable neighborhoods. Utilizing a mix of federal grant money, private donations, state parks grants, in additional state funding obtained by our state legislative delegation, we have been able to restore or renovate seven city parks and playgrounds with two more scheduled for construction this spring. And, and tomorrow, 
our newly renovated, revitalized DW Field golf course will open for the season. So I'll be checking to see who's at work tomorrow. Today, Brockton is at the forefront of emerging 21st century cities that are dedicated to municipal modernization, innovation, and growth, the keys for long-term prosperity. To attract the private investments that we see coming to downtown Brockton today, there must be public investment first. The state's investment of $10 million in the new parking garage and $26 million in the new Ganley State Office Building has helped us to spur over $100 million of new private investment in the downtown. I am committed to continue working closely with the Baker Polito administration and our state legislative delegation to create conditions under which economic development can flourish, not only just here in Brockton, but throughout the Commonwealth. That is why I recently accepted Governor Baker's offer to serve on the Massachusetts Municipal Working Group, working with state and municipal leaders to find new ways for local governments to leverage state resources and reduce state regulatory burdens. In recent years, we have struggled to overcome the continuous underfunding of our public school system by the state. The shortfall of state educational funding has caused painful cutbacks in recent budgets, despite the city's contribution of $5.3 million to the school budget in excess of the state requirement in just the past two years. Our public school system is what creates a level playing field of opportunity for all students growing up in the Commonwealth. Today, that is no longer the case. The disparity in resources available to students growing up in gateway cities like Brockton versus their counterparts in the more affluent suburbs is not only unfair, it's unconstitutional. And we've been working hard with our state legislative delegation to get the necessary changes to the Chapter 70 local aid to education formula to fairly reimburse Brockton for the true cost of educating all of our students. More than 50 years ago, it was President John F. Kennedy who recognized the right of every child to an equal and high quality public school education when he said, quote, not every child has an equal talent or an equal ability or an equal motivation, but they should have an equal right to develop their talent and their ability and their motivation to make something of themselves. Brockton led the fight for equity and education funding back in the 1980s and 90s, and we will now continue to lead that fight again. In order to keep Brockton moving forward, we must be looking forward. During the past year, Brockton has been able to create four opportunity zones within the city. Opportunity zones created under the 2018 federal tax reform create incentives for investors by deferring or eliminating long-term capital gains tax on qualifying investments within those zones. These opportunity zones identify specific areas where we believe the city's next wave of development will occur. Two of the zones blanket the city's entire downtown, including the CSX rail yards, the second largest parcel of undeveloped commercial real estate in the city. The CSX advisory group, comprised of state and local officials, business owners, and community members, are already working to identify the highest and best uses and the most advantageous model for development of that property. A third zone encompasses the area around the Brockton Fairgrounds, and the fourth zone covers the Exit 18 area around the Good Samaritan Hospital, within which we have identified the potential of a 45-acre development that focuses on life science and biotech. And in fact, It's Ward 7, Shirley. Uh, in fact, earlier today, Lieutenant Governor Polito and Mass Development 
awarded a $150,000 grant to the city of Brockton to develop a conceptual site plan for a life science biotech campus at that site. <laughs> Brockton is already known as a major healthcare center with our three regional hospitals and neighborhood health center, which employ over 8,000 people here. Now the city has been working in partnership with the Massachusetts Life Science Center, Mass Development, and MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning to identify and nurture a growing cluster of life science firms here in Greater Brockton. Already representing over 800 jobs, the life science cluster includes drug and pharmaceutical research and production, medical devices and equipment design and manufacturing, assorted research, testing and medical labs, and bioscience-related distribution. We will be working with Mass Hire Greater Brockton Workforce Board, Brockton High School, Massasoit Community College, and Bridgewater State University in an effort to design and implement career pathways in the biotechnology and STEM fields that would provide a career for Brockton residents interested in pursuing opportunities in the Brockton and Greater Boston Life Science Cluster. Since my days serving on the Brockton School Committee, I've worked tirelessly to support public education and the students of the Brockton Public Schools. I've been ranked as the second most vocal mayor in the U.S. in seeking more funding for education, and I will never waver from my unrelenting commitment to provide the children of our great city the best education possible. So consistent... <laughs> So consistent with that commitment, tonight I announce an initiative to provide the best and most up-to-date technology to our students. With surplus money from our mild winter, I will be asking the City Council to transfer more than a half million dollars to the Brockton Public Schools for the express purpose of putting more than 1,000 new laptop computers directly in the hands of our students to give Brockton youth the best to give our Brockton youth the best chance to learn, grow, and compete with the best students throughout the Commonwealth. Since my first day in office, I've also worked tirelessly to support the men and women of the Brockton Police and Fire Departments. They're compensated like the professionals they are, and they have the equipment to do their jobs and do them well. The final frontier in that support of public safety is the facilities in which they work. Both the police and fire department headquarters are dreadful, outdated, and outmoded buildings ill-suited to house modern-day public safety agencies. I will also be asking the City Council to transfer money from our snow and ice surplus to support the next step in our master planning for a new public safety campus that would create state-of-the-art facilities for both our police and fire departments. This next step will bring us from a concept to a preliminary design and cost estimate and will allow the council and our community to begin to envision the benefits of new, modern, and centrally located facilities for our first responders. Gathering tonight in this War Memorial building, it seems not only appropriate but mandatory that we recognize our veterans. There are bricks on the walkway that leads into this building inscribed with the names of brave men and women who fought for our right to freely assemble here this evening. It also seems fitting that we're joined here tonight by Congressman Lynch. Throughout his career in Congress, no one has fought harder for our veterans than Congressman Lynch. And Congressman... Congressman, we recognize you for your unwavering support of our veterans. Supporting our veterans and our active duty service members is not only good public policy, 
It's a moral imperative. Members of the Brockton Police and Fire Department suit up and show up each day prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice. A few of them go beyond that commitment and serve in our armed forces, adding another dimension of dedication and honor. As mayor, I applaud that additional pledge of loyalty to the safety and security to us all, and will be filing with the City Council a request to adopt some provisions of the Massachusetts Brave Act approved by the legislature and signed by the governor last year. One section will provide for salary stability and no loss of vacation time for employees who serve both our country and our city while they're away from home. This will not only provide economic security to the families of service members who are deployed and otherwise serving, it will send a clear message that this city understands, supports, and applauds the sacrifices of those who wear the uniform. In addition, I'll be working with the City Council to increase the amount allowable under the Veterans Tax Work Off from $1,000 to $1,500 per home, providing a financial boost to those who have already served and allowing them to do work on behalf of the city and earn a credit on their property taxes. These two provisions begin to fulfill our commitment to those who commit themselves to us every day. Now, I've been asked by many what my position is on the adoption of the Brockton United Ordinance, which is presently being considered for passage by the Brockton City Council. This ordinance, co-sponsored by Councilor Jean Bradley de Renincourt, is actually a sanctuary city piece of legislation. Those who favor Brockton becoming a sanctuary city tell me that they want the Brockton Police Department to equally enforce the law without regard to one's immigration status. The Brockton Police Department does already reflect those values of equal law enforcement, always. Earlier, I referenced the success we've had reducing violent crime in the past five years. An integral part of our overall strategy that has produced those results is our close collaboration with all federal law enforcement agencies. We rely upon the resources and manpower that federal agencies bring to joint investigations with the Brockton Police Department. Let me cite two recent examples. Three Tennessee men were arrested by Brockton Police with an arsenal of high capacity weapons and ammunition. The Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms stepped in to take the lead on the investigation. Not only does the ATF bring advanced ballistics technology and the potential for federal prosecution, but their involvement also frees up our Brockton detectives to work on other cases. Back in July, Brockton and State Police arrested Dedrick Lindsay, already a convicted felon, on fentanyl and cocaine trafficking charges, plus illegal possession of a handgun. Just last week, the U.S. Attorney charged Lindsay in federal court with being an armed career criminal that carries with it a sentence of 15 years to life. The city of Brockton will be a safer place with him in federal prison. So let me be clear. Brockton is not a sanctuary city. As long as I'm the mayor, Brockton will not become a sanctuary city. And if the city council chooses to pass the sanctuary city ordinance, I will veto it. I will not restrict the ability of the Brockton Police Department to get gang members and drug dealers off the streets of our city by any means necessary. <laughs> Nor will I jeopardize our crucial relationships with federal law enforcement agencies. As mayor, I have a duty to the residents of Brockton to put public safety first above politics and ideology. Yes. 
So lastly, when George Washington was sworn into his first term as President of the United States of America in April of 1789, there was no precedent for how long he could have served as President. He imposed upon himself a term limit of two terms. Term limits are not a new concept. In colonial America, term limits were referred to as the rotary system or the principle of rotation in office. Tonight I announce that within 30 days, I intend to file with the city clerk's office a proposed home rule petition imposing term limits on all local officials. I strongly believe that no official should serve in the same elective office for more than five consecutive terms, 10 years. I ask the members of the City Council to favorably consider imposing term limits on all of us, myself included. I'm not sure if they're in favor of term limits or limiting my term of service. No one person, whether it be me or anyone else, should serve in office forever. The only thing that should be forever is the hope that the good people of Brockton will always get the freshest and most energetic public officials willing to serve, and most importantly, to have the largest number of candidates to choose from. The citizens of Brockton deserve no less than this. So as I leave you, let me sum up the state of our city with just a few words. Buildings are going up, crime is going down. Buildings are going up, crime is going down. Thank you so much. <laughs>